Well, hi everyone. Welcome. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for One Schoolhouse. I am delighted to have you with us today, Heather, and I'm just going to share with everybody a teeny bit about what's going on at One Schoolhouse, and then we will get started. Um, so on our blog right now, a piece by Liz Cates, our Assistant Head of School for School Engagement, talking about Gen Z is all of our students now, beginning to end. And what does that mean when we think about gener generational change and retention? And next week, we're gonna be talking about advanced independent curriculum. So you know that I have a passion for that. Summer professional learning is live on our website. I invite you to join us for any and all of our upcoming courses. Uh, we've got courses for academic leaders, courses for teachers on we know we want to rest and recover this summer, and yet there are some challenges next year too. So really balancing that approach in a way that is asyn asynchronous, you can take it on your own time. So check those out if you can. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. And Heather, I've known you for a few years now. Exactly. Super delighted that you're here. To those who don't know, Heather is the Executive Director and CEO of the Enrollment Management Association. And I'll refer to that as EMA throughout our webinar. Heather has deep experience in independent schools, some of which I just learned about this morning. <laughs> She's been an advisor, a school admissions officer. She's worked with other independent school associations prior to assuming the leadership of EMA. And Heather, thank you again for joining us. Just a reminder to everyone else housekeeping, we'll use the chat to share resources with one another and the Q&A to ask Heather questions. Do you mind just kicking off with an introduction? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, you touched on kind of why I'm here to begin with, which is I was a lucky enough uh, person to go to a private independent school for the last three years of high school and it changed my life. Um, and so I'm a graduate, a very proud graduate. Uh, I'm a parent of two different schools, all of them Quaker. That was our, our family kind of history, right? Um, I've been a trustee for two schools. I taught art history back in the day when I first joined my school. So I've got some interesting um, hats that I've worn. Um, and I was an administrator in schools for a while. Lately, I've been spending a lot of time with independent school associations and organizations doing trustee work. That's where I met Brad actually of One Schoolhouse on the NBOA board. So. Um, I've learned a lot um, from all those different uh, perches and um, believe deeply in the work that our schools do, and especially in the last year, the role we play in society. So I'll say more about that as we kind of walk through today. Um, um, second, you know, most of my professional life, I was at NAIS. Um, I had a little run at the Association of Boarding Schools, um, and I've been at EMA for about 10 years. And in all of those um, years, you know, in different associations, I would say the one thing with all the connections to many different schools that I've observed is that I really appreciate our community's commitment to excellence. This is what I believe sets us apart and everyone defines it differently. So excellence means different things to different schools, but I think it's in the DNA of our schools and it's really been tested this year. Um, but because we are market-driven schools, we wouldn't exist if people weren't willing to pay our tuitions and support us, right? We have to be, um, you know, assume sort of a leadership mantle, I think, in K through 12 society. And, and for that, I, and I think we're doing an amazing work and there's stories to be told uh, post pandemic about our, our work, which I think is really exciting. You know, thirdly, I'll say, um, since coming to EMA, you know, as executive director, I've been thinking a lot about what makes schools healthy and successful, particularly from an enrollment perspective. That's, you know, that's my little specialty area. Um, and, like I said, I wore, I wore many hats. And I, I think one of the things that has happened in the last 20 years has been this growing professionalization of different roles in schools. And, mm -hmm. and EMA is just one more association dedicated to helping the enrollment professionals. There's certainly been birth of the business officers, et cetera, development. And I would say inadvertently, I think our work has contributed mm -hmm. sometimes to silos in schools. And I hope that the post pandemic world be one of coming together um, I've heard a great deal in the last year from enrollment leaders who really want EMA to work hard at building connections and eroding these silos because the issues that everyone's working on are so complex right now and so connected and uh, we need to come together and one of our goals in our strategic plan is to really sort of bring people together um, across common shared interests and I believe there's a great 
connection to be built between academic leaders in schools and those who you know, build the enrollment strategy for schools. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to talk to one schoolhouse uh, folks as a result. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And I think you know, your diversity of experience and the perspective of looking at how many different schools do school is really valuable. And then when you mentioned the silos, I know that that resonated with academic leaders because that is something that we, we talk about a lot. We see silos, they, they're so easy to build maybe mm -hmm. and hard to break down. Um, so moving on, as we say often in these webinars, and I'm gonna say it again, this year was different. Can yeah. you just tell us a little bit about how this year was different for enrollment professionals? Oh, for sure. It was very different. Um, and of course we, we saw it last a, a year ago spring when everything went virtual, when everybody was at home. So on the fly, they had to figure out ways to kind of close the deal, if you will, to new families. They were trying to figure out how do I convince these families inside of a pandemic to enroll in our schools, right? And just it was a lot of confusion at the time. We did a lot of sharing at EMA, which helped people share their best tricks of what was working for them. It was a lot of like, every week on the fly movement. And, and I think that was true in the academic world. What's working out there as we move completely to online and you know lots of sharing going on, which was a good, a positive effect, right? Um, what happened though, was that so many families were so disrupted that uh, a tip of the typical year didn't end or, or didn't finish easily for many schools, say in June, when you had everyone enrolled, tucked in, you know, summer off, that kind of thing, that just didn't happen. Right. And what happened instead for many schools was they saw this influx in July and August of new families staring at the next school year, terrified for their children. Uh, they wanted their children to have as much as possible, either an in-school experience or a quality experience or both, right? And a lot of people have been using this phrase of flight to quality. And I think that they saw independent schools as a proxy for that. So this boom happened for many schools that weren't hitting their enrollment goals. Suddenly they were uh, seeing many more people knocking at the door and this continued through fall and even into winter. And I know teachers absorbed that all the way through the year as new students were added mm -hmm. mid-year, three quarters of the way through. And thank you for um, being responsive like that, being adaptive, it isn't easy. It's never easy. It changes what happens in your classroom, I know, but it really, uh, meant a lot to your enrollment colleagues that you were able to be flexible and agile um, because they needed that kind of um, you know, support to be able to meet enrollment goals often. So that was the first big hurrah, right? And there were articles in the New York Times about the rush to get into private schools. That was all good. And then the fall began and it was slow, slow, slow. No one was thinking about hey, how do I get my child into school a year from now? It was survival mode, right? I'm sure teachers can relate to this. I mean, you're probably living day to day on, are we gonna be in school? Are we gonna be out of school? Is it a week of you know, um, working online with my students, et cetera? So- It could change um, in an afternoon. It could change in an afternoon. It could change with a board's decision that you were gonna remain open, even with health advisors telling you not to. I mean, I heard every variation on a theme, right? Mm -hmm. So I think just like teachers who had to flip through the summer and work all summer to get ready for a year like no other, the same was true for enrollment people. And they had business goals to meet. They had numbers to meet, right? So everyone's exhausted right now. Teachers are exhausted. Administrators are exhausted. Leaders are exhausted, right? Um, and then enrollment people didn't have the normal tools they use to build classes, right? They didn't have the events that they could go off site and you know, meet new families and fairs and they didn't use admission testing this year. And so the selection process for new students, um, even the most selective schools was quite different. And I've had really honest conversations with a number of uh, my colleagues in enrollment who are very worried. They've done the best they can. Many of them had more teachers involved in the selection process this year. I think another great and good positive effect, but with not as much information or uneven information in files for, for students who'd been living at that point with what, six or seven months of disruption, sometimes no easy narrative or grades to understand how they've done. There's a worry that the class coming in this fall is not gonna be ready in the same way as classes in the past, right? And of course, who's gonna absorb all the work on that? <laughs> the academic leaders. So I think there's just a lot of worry that um, 
you know, there are going to be a lot of gaps to be met, even with having tried very hard to renovate a process on the fly and do the best job they could. Um, and then the selective schools, especially, it was the best of times for them. They had the largest number of applicants, um, by far in some cases, by thousands, right? Um, and inside of that, lots of politics. Um, it, you know, in a normal year, you don't have board members bugging you too much about they know to kind of stay, stay away from the decision making right. process. But with the amped up energy, there were people writing that they'd never heard from before, pushing for a particular candidate or not. So it's been a very political um, year in so many ways, right? <laughs> political in terms of our society, yeah. but also inside our schools. And so I think um, that that's all very concerning. People are exhausted. You know, this growth in demand um, may continue through this summer because I think parents are starting to get feedback now from maybe the public schools they've been in and not, again, not happy, feeling upset about maybe some learning loss for their children now looking at other options for their children. So all this I think says that we're gonna still be in a time of confusion and uncertainty. Um, and there may be more downstream um, requests from the enrollment folks of academic leaders as we go through this fall, because both with the admitted class and with perhaps people coming late to the to the door to say, look, I really have a need for my child to be in your school. There could be a lot more of that just irregular kind of behavior that will require lots of patience, <laughs> right? And a, a lot more accommodation, yeah. So a, a word that comes to mind is fraught. Yes. Things that used to maybe be easier to make or things were, the way was clear. It seems like there's, it's fraught, more opportunities for missteps. Right, right. I mean, one of my colleagues, Tim Fish at EMA, who many of you may know because he teaches innovation courses at, EMA, uh, sorry, at, um, at NEIS and he's on our board at EMA. He said, you know, the, the lack, of, you know, people are so carefully planned and built so much of what they do on planning, but you've had to plan literally on the fly for so long. It's like, it's almost hard to get back to the old way of doing it. And yet, you know, you want the time to build your class to be the best it can be, or to build your enrollment strategy to be the best it can be. Right. And having to do it again on the fly has been hard. It's been hard for almost everyone, including the leaders in our schools. So, yeah. Right. So now I'm going to ask you to do something that's a, a little bit unfair, <laughs> um, which is to look into the future and tell all of us exactly what's going to happen. Um, no. <laughs> Sorry. But are there generalizations that you can make, maybe some trends that you saw coming that have emerged and it intensified or things awesome. that you see shifting? What are some yes, ideas? Yes, there's some really some interesting news, good news. First of all, Last year, the number of international students coming to our schools dramatically dropped. I'm sure your teachers know that. Um, it makes me sad, actually. I thought that many schools were doing really well, building um, you know, a more global perspective by having a lot of students from different countries. And of course, borders shut down, pandemic issues happened, the, the politics last summer were different than they are now. And that meant fewer international students. For some schools, that was significant enough to really be challenging for that by enrollment. I do think that those markets will come back as the global health situation improves. Uh, didn't happen in Canada, interestingly enough. They, they had different policies, so they did not lose the same percentages as US-based mm. schools did. So an interesting point of view about just how national policies can dictate school health. Um, but we're also seeing, you mentioned this in your intro, Sarah, and we're, we saw, um, we do a study every third year called the Ride to Independent Schools. It's about, um, parents going through the process and we survey parents to ask them, you know, just about their thinking. And so we had pandemic parents last summer talking to us, right? And one of the big things we saw in the data was this generational shift that you alluded to um, with the Gen Y, right? The sort of the different behaviors coming through and how that's going to shift how we have to respond from our schools. And I do think we're at the earliest stages of understanding that. There are two kind of generations that we saw inside of our research data. Gen Xers who are very data-driven, very outcomes-driven, very um, managing of their children's lives. And you know the, the sort of folks in Z are much more, and millennials are much more open to um, a much more customized view of their child, really want teachers to adapt strategies to help their child almost on an individualized basis, right? 
want you to deeply know and love their children. We do that very well in independent schools. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things I think is going to help our value kind of rise more widely um, across the country is that we already have that built into the DNA of our schools. You know, we do care individually for children, right? And collectively for children too. So I think that's amazing. And, you know, I told you the story um, when we were getting ready for this webinar, Sarah, but it makes me think back to, we did we do surveying of parents because we serve about 50 to 80,000, depending on the year at EMA, you know, with admission testing, common application, et cetera. And, we were doing some sort of prototyping and testing using design thinking techniques with families about three years ago. And I just remember this conversation I had with a parent so well, because I was interviewing him, trying to get more details about his admission experience. He didn't want to talk about that. He talked about the reasons why he initially looked at schools mm -hmm. and then he enrolled in our schools and then why he was staying, right? And he said, the reasons I looked at the school wasn't the reason I decided to stay. And I said, oh, tell me more. What, what do you think? He said, I was driven because I wanted my child to have a more academically rigorous experience. They were kind of coasting in the local public school, which is well rated. And I wanted them to just be challenged. And I did a lot of research, found the right school. We, and we were able to get my child in, enrolled him. He said, the reason I stay was the faculty. My child became loved by other adults. We had an extended family thanks to this school. And I will be forever grateful that I have these adults now in my children's life as they go through college, you know, kind of forever guiding them and mentoring them with the same values that my family has. That's the gift of independent schools. Why don't you talk about it more in all that you do, right? Because that's why we stayed. That's why we write checks now to the, you know, the advancement folks. And I think that's really true. The power of the teaching experience in our schools is why people are willing at the end of the day to say, mm -hmm. you know what, um, I have many choices out there, but this is why I'm gonna keep invested in the school because my children are having amazing re adults, adult relationships, right? Yeah, I think, um, I love that reminder, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one other trend, which I, I'll mention now and we can get back to it, it becomes something, but we were watching kind of a concerning trend with fewer and fewer and fewer families in lower schools across the country nationally, declines in major markets everywhere, even ones that are always steady like New York, at the lower grades, fewer families applying, less selectivity, et cetera. And there were lots of reasons, including numbers of students available, like children weren't born, there was like a student bubble, right? But that has reversed itself in this last year. Um, I think particularly families who um, were involved with their public schools and didn't have much of a school available to them, were at home with their children and frustrated and desperate for a better experience for their children, the little ones, right? Mm -hmm. And so they turned kind of en masse. And so we're hearing record numbers being reported at application levels for the lower grades. And that was not true even a year ago. So that's good news because often those families, if they come and stay, will feed, right? The school all the right. way through if you're K through 12. But uh, we were worried about it. And I think the pandemic created a positive for us in that regard. Yeah, and so I hate to, um, I hate to think of what, well, it's just feels a little weird, right? To say, well, we benefited from something that was, right. was so awful. And yet um, that's a nice, sort of segue into a topic I wanted us to talk about, which is our audience is academic leaders. So we've got yeah. division directors, department chairs, um, academic deans. And so their role in enrollment. So if families mm -hmm. have come for a year because they felt like they had a short-term problem, they were looking at, you know, how much will my child grow this year? Yeah. Um, and, and we have to acknowledge that that's really specific. Yes, yes. Right. Yep. There's, kids grew in ways we didn't measure. Right. Year. Right. Of course. Yes, exactly. But so now there, there keep... will be other positive outcomes we can turn to probably years from now to say, look what happened. Right. We yeah. may not know them now, but there will be right. Both good and bad to the year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I think academic leaders and division leaders have a lot um, of power uh, to really help with enrollment success. And let me just double down that last story I told because I have my personal story in that my daughter uh, went to a private school for high school and middle school and high school. And, um, you know, people stay 
enrolled with schools and connected to schools for human reasons. They just do, right? I, I know that beautiful buildings matter to some and pretty campuses and all of that, but I am devoted to my daughter's school because of the kindness of one particular person she adored, her English teacher. And he found her crying senior year. She hadn't finished her admission essay for colleges and she just couldn't get it done. He found her in a corner and you know calmed her down and then said, look, I'll help you. Like, come to me. Why didn't you come to me? Right. And so, you know, five rounds later, you know, he, they had put together what she was proud of, right? And no one asked him to do that. It wasn't part of his job description, but he did it. And I'm telling the story because it's those instances and you have them all over your school, right? Where when you make that deep connection, teacher makes a connection to a child like that in great empathy and support, there's just nothing better, right? It's just, it's, it's magic. And for my daughter, it was magic. She still adores his teacher to this day. They're friends on Facebook. I follow him because I, I adore him too, right? And Dan Heath, who is a writer about marketing, talks about what do you do to create stickiness with your product, mm -hmm. right? And this is what this is our stick. It's it's the it's the these faculty deep faculty relationships with students are why people stay. Back to that earlier point. So student success isn't just born because you know you do do well academically, you get your good grades, yay yay. It's really born of the affective side of what we do in our communities, and the more we can commit ourselves. It's so easy to get really busy and to miss the kid crying in the corner, right? But he didn't, right? And I think, you know, the power we have are those kinds of stories, the echoing that extra mile, which we do all the time, right? Um, it's, it's doubling down on that and understanding that though, making space for that, making sure that, you know, if you're an advisor, you've done something special for every of your advisees, right? You've gone the extra mile, you've taken them for a walk, right? Just to check in on them. Because we know there's issues of wellness uh, right now, right? Um, right, so literally the extra mile. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing to know is research that we've conducted and actually that Tim Fish and NAIS has conducted um, suggests that there are enrollment breakpoints for big schools, K through 12 schools, They parents make decisions at the, at the break. So if it's fifth or sixth grade when your elementary school ends, they'll reconsider, right? Mm -hmm. And again, at the end of middle school, they'll reconsider. And so um, really thinking about ways to both have a very sticky last year, like a, you don't wanna leave because fifth grade is gonna be so great or sixth grade, right? And the same with whatever that break point, eighth grade, right? Um, but also something exceptional happening that you can't, you don't wanna ever leave for because that next year is gonna be that much greater. I know many schools have created signature programs, right? To um, really bring the class together. And those are the points in our data that suggest that's when families reevaluate and either move on or decide to stay, right? So I would say for the divisional leaders out there, be thinking about how you create those kinds of connections and programs so that no one, um, you want to stay, right? There is that too. There are sometimes just mismatches, but no one that you want to stay chooses to move on because you've got such excitement in the next realm. And, you know, uh, Tim Fish told a great story from NEIS where he has these strategy labs. People come in trying to solve a problem, teams from schools, and the school came in uh, trying to solve a problem around their enrollment challenges, right? And after looking at the data, they determined that these breakpoints were their biggest problems and particularly eighth to ninth grade. And when they started pulling uh, even more data and diving deeper, they found that there was lots of unhappiness with one teacher in ninth grade whose approach was pretty tough, right? And nobody wanted their kid to get assigned to that teacher. Right? They were terrified that, you know, they would have a bad ninth grade experience. And I think what happened is the school made a decision, well, that person really probably belongs only teaching, you know, juniors and seniors. He's tough. He's got high standards. Maybe the ninth graders need some, a different approach. They rearranged a little bit to try to address some, some of the market concerns coming from, from parents, right? So I would say examine those places in your school where you get exit survey that's consistent and you see patterns. And if there are academic patterns, try to address them, right, creatively, because you can help your enrollment leader build the better retention and, and not have to deal with lots of attrition each year if you can take care of some of the concerns. And sometimes it's just dumb stuff, right? Um, again, back to the school I served on the board, consistently the school was like a, a power player in soccer consistently we heard you know the school doesn't have a great uh, athletic program it was like what is going on here so we talked to the pr folks um and the marketing folks and said can you just put a message out like i don't know once every two weeks 
just release it out to the local papers about a positive athletic story because there's some great stories to be told by, you know, for the school. It reversed itself within two years. So sometimes it's just bad information that gets mm-hmm. out there, right? Or you need to redirect some things on in messaging on your website. Um, it's not truth and actually what's happening on the ground, but you have to address it, you know, because um, perceptions equal reality for many families. So, yeah. I come back to that. We have a question in the Q&A and I want to remind everybody, please do put questions in the Q&A. They're welcome because we addressed this. Um, Deb asks about lower school enrollment has increased. Do you think schools will be able to retain most of these families? And you talked about transfer points and you talked about the role of building excitement for next year for academic leaders. Is there anything really specific to lower school that you want to offer? Ah, That's really, that's a good question. It is the question I will tell you. Um, In fact, we ran a retention seminar to hear from some schools with best practices in that space because we heard it so much from our enrollment leaders. They were worried that post pandemic people would be like, okay, we're all set. We can, you know, bounce back to whatever our public school, wherever we were before, right? Um, what I think has happened is it, it's, it's, it's the two extremes. Either people had such an amazing experience this year and are so grateful for the experience they've had with your school, even if it's been open or not, online or not, they're grateful because they see um, their child has probably thrived for the most part. Mm -hmm. And there's data out there from the Educational Records Bureau, ERB. They've done some academic achievement um, uh, reports based on some of their standardized testing that has shown that everyone has had learning loss to some degree this year in independent schools and in public schools, but dramatically so in public schools. And in independent schools, there's been a really interesting twist in that um, middle school girls have gained uh, uh, ground uh, in in numerous areas during the year from working largely online in in schools, right? So interesting to sort of think about that and deep dive a little bit. Did they gain more voice? What was going on there? But regardless, I think we're, again, my theory is we have a very good story to tell about how we led through this very, big crisis, right? And, um, and also, I think the power of community is remains. And so how you've built community, I just have watched some magnificent experiences, even uh, in a school that was online for most of the year because of being shut down, the kinds of things they did to build community, regardless, they had coffee hours for parents to talk about wellness issues, they had you know, a cocktail hour once a month with the parents of lower school. They did all these things. They had like crazy game nights, right? For um, children, right? To play and not just have to have class together. So they did some amazing things online that they would never have done um, otherwise, right? We've heard from enrollment leaders. They've gained so much insight because they've had to flip to online, doing online interviews. They've learned so much about families as they broadcast from their homes to better understand the family circumstances. And one, I know one school says they're never going to go back. They're always going to have that option. People would rather just interview from home, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's um, more convenient, right? Working families sometimes can't take a full day off to come and visit the school. They've gotten better at telling their story without having to make you, you know, drive in their case, it was San Francisco. So two hours from your home to get, you know, through traffic and come for a visit. So I think, you know, there are going to be some practices that we can push forward that are really good ones that we've learned. Um, And I think it will make our value that much higher. My guess is we have about another year or so because of the wider concern with parents right now around quality. And um, here's the other really incredibly sad fact of the pandemic. Three million children didn't go to school this year in the United States, three million. Our country is gonna be paying sort of sad, um, paying downstream for this, I really believe in the next decade, right? As we try to find those students and bring them back largely in kind of the lowest socioeconomic um, you know, uh, cohorts. And this is heartbreaking. And imagine bringing those students back and trying to get them back into school and learning again, the kind of work it's gonna take inside of public schools to make that happen, right? So I actually think it's gonna, shift inside of what happens in public schools too, but it may for educationally ambitious families who are unwilling, right? They want their children to not only, you know, catch up to where they should be, 
but excel, I think this is going to put the heat on the independent school community, right, in ways that we may not imagine. So, I mean, academic leaders, I'm sure you're already hearing it, right? You may, there may be gaps as kids come to you from their, where they've been, and they're asking you to sort of step up and address that, those individual needs, right, in new ways. I think, again, online learning gives us some tools. I'm sure, um, you know, when Schoolhouse is thinking about this too, because these gaps um, are really concerning to parents and our schools, you know, can put in place ways to help get there, right? Whether it's through collaboration with one schoolhouse or a different arrangement with, um, you know, learning specialists in our schools, right? Or some combination thereof. So I think that we have a good story to tell, A, as a community of schools. B, I think our independence lets us keep adapt being adaptive and innovative. And um, even though we are tuition charging, and that's sometimes hard for parents, um, once you get into a behavior for over 12 months, you tend to stick with it, they say, as an adult. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, because parents are concerned about um, where they came from and they've joined us for a year, they're not going to see it as a one-year piece. Now, we've done a little anecdotal surveying, right? Um, we don't have national data yet to see have people deposited, right? Because you have to send back your contract. And there's not, we're not raising any alarms yet, but a number of people um, have advised us that the real story will be told in July when the first tuition check is normally due. So we'll be watching that carefully because when you have to pay again for your mm -hmm. child's education and it comes due, you may be willing to forego the $500 deposit you put in or the thousand dollar deposit because you just don't want to belly up the additional, you know, tuition, right? So, right. so keep we're going to watch that carefully. Retention, I, I really believe, I, I, I will say this and double down on it again and again, I think the relationships built with teachers are why families stay. It's why I, I kept writing the check because my child was being cared for by incredible teachers with values that were shared by my family. Um, she was surrounded by really interesting peers at her school from all over the world. It was such an incredible experience. Um, and I really wanted, you know, to keep funding it because she was thriving, right? And so this is my hope is that families who may never have thought about us and just thought about us for a stopgap situation are now seeing the, the great value because of the experience um, that, and, you know, that it's been a great experience for the most part, uh, even though it's been a challenging year, right? Right. And I think that's the call out to academic leaders as we wrap this up is what do you do in your work that supports and fosters that relationship between uh, students and teachers? And I, I got a ping here reminding me that when we think about kids learning this year and the gaps with, that you brought up and the fact that we're going to use every resources we have to help kids, maybe Maybe every skill doesn't have to be backfilled. Tom came on from Tom Rashawn from ERB came on yeah. and he said, you know, you've got to decide. Okay, you can you can do what you haven't read this novel that we usually yeah. read. You can live the rest of your life. Hopefully you'll read it eventually. <laughs> um, so right. figure, what what are the what are the gold standards? What's transfer? Yes, what's reasoning. What are those skills that you need to to really push? And I think academic leaders can really help frame that conversation. Oh, hundred percent. And my sense is just knowing um, the people I know in, in academia in our schools, the concept of having your team come back. I mean, you can do all this online, like orienting families before you're ready to go in the fall, but imagine just getting a sense of where are you? Are there just huge numbers of kids who need that help and reasoning and you don't want them to miss it, right? To be able to put forth a plan sometime in the fall to say, look, we've, we've had a couple of weeks of classes now. We're seeing these three things that we wanna focus on, right? And in addition to like wellness issues too, right? We're going to focus all these things because we know that the last year has been really tough for you families and tough for your children. So we're going to be doing these things as part of um, our program this year because we know their needs and we've, we've witnessed them now as we've gotten underway. And so know that we're on this, right? In ways we have the ability to do that because we are independent. We, we're not controlled by a, um, a bureaucracy that requires us to meet you know, a particular set of standards you know, at a particular time. So that's the gift we have, right? The other thing I'll say is, I, I don't want to um, forget to say this, uh, a marketing company who, and I can't remember the source, so forgive me for that part, uh, studied 
uh, behaviors of families on websites. And the first place they go, they, they look at your academic program. That's, that's the driver as we know, right? They want us to know what your philosophy is, what you offer, et cetera. The next place they look is the head of school, the leadership. They want to understand who's running the, the place, right? If there are faculty bios, it's often the third place they go. They want to know who will be teaching and being with their children. So if your school does that or, or seeks, to, seeks out stories from you to build their narrative and enrollment and marketing, you know, spend the time telling your stories because they're beautiful. And the story I told you about like the teacher finding my crying daughter, like those, that's the reason people want to be at your school, right? At the end of the day, like who doesn't want a, a child to be comforted and loved, right? And the more you can tell the stories of how you love children and care for them, as much as you teach them amazing skills and both, um, you know, character skills, value skills, and academic skills, I think the more you're going to be able to be a partner in building enrollment success for your school. I cannot think of a better way to close this, thinking about caring for students. We ran a little bit over, but it was worth Sorry about that. a minute of gold. Thank you. Known for lots Bye. of talking here. Okay, great. Nice to be with you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. See you next week.